because had I been out there in a cabin in the wilderness, surrounded by hostile Indians, I would have wanted Lou Wetzel on my side. Now, the decision to come to try to make a settlement west of the River Ohio certainly didn't come about all at once. It was a long time in the making. And it really came about after the revolution simply because everybody was broke. And, you know, wars are expensive. They're expensive now. They were expensive then. And uh, so after the revolution, uh, many of these officers found that they had uh, staked their fortunes as well as their lives. They had, in many cases, they had mortgaged their farms and used the money to finance the revolution. And so now they had, uh, they were officers. This meant they were well past or into middle age. And so here you are, well in the middle age. You've spent every cent you've got on a war that's successful. And but what do you do? Uh, the soldiers are paid by a little slip of paper that's called a continental. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what the wording on a piece of paper called a continental, but it said something like, you fought a good war, boys, and if we ever get any money, we'll pay you. That was the gist of the continental. And uh, so that's a good promise, and they believed that sooner or later, <clears throat> the government would have money to be able to pay them. But meanwhile, how do you cope with circumstances right now? I mean, a piece of paper will not buy sheets for the baby or hay for the horse. And uh, so a group of the officers get together and they form a company called the Ohio Company of Associates. And uh, they decide that there are all this land west of the River Ohio. Several of them have been here on surveying trips or just on exploration. George Washington had been down the river in 1770 and so they knew it was here. They knew it was a good land and much of it was still available. And so they decided to petition Congress to buy that. Now that was a long drawn out process because they didn't get their request met immediately. It remained for Manasseh Cutler to finally make the winning argument for selling them uh, almost a million and a half acres of land. And uh, so they were to pay for it, part of it with their continentals, with their certificates and the rest of it they would pay for it with cash. But meanwhile, now they had a hold on it. And the ordinance of 1787 had made this possible for them because it's hard for us to imagine no law. That's something we've grown up with. It's just part of our psyche. But if you are going into a territory where there is absolutely no provision made for settling it, you've no backbone, you've nothing to tie on to. But the ordinance of 1787 was the document that gave them that necessary framework. And it was a very simple, it doesn't sound like a simple document, and it doesn't look like one. But really, when you analyze it, it's all about land. The first part tells what the land and the government will do for you, and that's good. And then, because there is no free lunch, uh, the second part of it tells what you shall do for the government and the land. That's basically it. And so, with this framework already in place, and with Manasseh Cutler's uh, masterful argument to Congress, they finally had permission to settle west of the Ohio. And so Rufus Putnam, because he has got quite, he has quite a background in a variety of things, and he's very good at organizing. He has good relationships with his men. He just seems like the right fellow for the job. And so he gets the job, and he sets about uh, forming, forming a crew to come. Now, he, the word goes out. But this is going to happen. And you have all these unemployed people from the war. So he must have had literally hundreds of people said, you know, I'm ready, willing, and able. And so he is able to handpick 47 men, very carefully handpick them. Uh, and he wants them not only because they are savvy in the wilderness, but because once they get to their destination, he is going to use the skills that these men have to build a civilization here. And so he wants carpenters, he wants millwrights, he wants blacksmiths, he wants uh, uh, people with skills that he can use after he gets here. He also wants a number of um, highly skilled marksmen with him because he knows that in spite of treaties that have been signed at, at uh, Fort Stanwick, at uh, uh, Fort McIntosh, and, and places that we've talked about before, this situation is still very tense. And so he wants this, these men to be able to look after themselves. Now their ages, uh, I found the spread of ages very interesting because the oldest man 
was uh, 68 years old. His name was Edmund Moe. And 68 years old is not old by the day standards, even though I do not feel like I can trek across the Alleghenies on foot. But still in all, it isn't old by the day standards, but it was then. The lifespan was not nearly as long as it is now. But Edmund Moulton was a, a silversmith, a goldsmith. And as such, he was a highly skilled man. And obviously in good health. His son was also with him. So they, they were, um, old Edmund Moulton was probably the oldest. The youngest man, his name was Hezekiah Flint Jr. And he couldn't have been more than 14 or 15 years old because his father was still in his 30s. His father, Hezekiah Flint Sr., was a young man. And they were carpenters. And so we had the ages of six, from 68 to 14 or 15. And there's no record that anybody made any special provisions for either one of these men. Hezekiah Jr. pulled his weight, Edmund pulled his. And uh, so with that wide range of age and talent and uh, characteristics, they started out for the Ohio country. Um, they, as I said, it was well mapped. They knew exactly where they were going. And they had chosen the land as carefully as they could. Now, of course, a lot of the prime Ohio land was already taken. Uh, the Connecticut settlers, you know, the fire lands, that was taken. There was a lot of it that was not available. This was what was available. It was available on the Ohio River, which was like the great interstate of that time. It was how you got there. Uh, not only was it available, but uh, there were no major Indian villages any place close. Now, this is odd because many people have uh, had many theories about why there were no major Indian villages here on the Ohio River. And uh, one theory is that the flooding of two major rivers, the Muskingum and the Ohio, uh, the flooding was widespread. And Indians were entirely too smart, unlike the settlers later on, to build their homes right down to the edge of major rivers that were going to wash them out. So that's one reason. Another reason could be, if you would look at the map, you would see that um, uh, the Ohio country is kind of catty-cornered in between uh, the Iroquois nation up here and the Shawnee nation down here. And these nations had been at war with one another for many years. And so essentially, it would be right in the middle of what might be called a warrior's path. And uh, no um, carefully thinking Indian is going to build his village in a path that is customarily used by people making war on one another. Those fellows are going to be in bad mood coming and going, no matter what the outcome. And so that's a second possible reason. Third possible reason is the fact that there were mounds here. This, you know, you've heard about the mounds in Marietta, the mound builders. Uh, the Indians, the historic Indians with whom we're dealing in this part of our story, were uh, very respectful of other people's burying grounds. And they would not have built a village on top of anyone else's burial grounds. They, this, this was long a bone of contention between whites and Indians clear out west about burial grounds and hunting grounds because they had, they had great respect for this. And that certainly would have been a factor in their decision not to make a village here. And so really, when you look at our part of the Ohio Valley, the closest major Indian village is up on the Tuscarawas, the uh, big villages up there, the Delaware, or the Shawnee in what is now Xenia, which then was old Jilagatha. And uh, so that they had all that going for it. The Ohio River, no major Indian villages. Isaac Williams has already settled across on the Virginia shore, and Isaac Williams has got quite a strong settlement there. He is a, uh, a well-known frontiersman. His wife, Rebecca, is a well-known healer and uh, very versatile as far as the healing arts are concerned. And then across on the other shore, on the Ohio shore, is Fort Harmon. So it's not only uh, not uh, on, it's on the river, no major Indian villages, and it's not completely isolated. There's a Williams settlement and Fort Harmon. And so that makes it a target. That makes it uh, very viable for a new settlement. So Rufus sets about, chooses his men, and begins the journey. Um, he's going to divide the party into two groups. First is going to be the boat builders. Plan is the boat builders are to cross the Alleghenies and go to Summerall's Ferry and build boats for the trip on down into the Ohio and on down to, to the mouth of the Uh The second party is the surveyors who are going to follow about a month behind him. 
And uh, the first party, I think it's about 22 men, and they're being led by a man by the name of Hatfield White. And Hatfield White and those fellows leave, I believe, about the 4th of December of 1787. And uh, as I said a little bit ago, I often wondered why they crossed the Alleghenies in the winter. Well, of course, the reason being they wanted to be at their destination in the spring to clear land and plant crops. That was why they made such a, a dangerous journey in the dead of winter. And then the second bunch of men, the surveyors and their crews, they left the uh, 1st of January, 1788. And they crossed the two parties about a month behind one another. They crossed the Alleghenies in the middle of winter, and they told about such a, such a journey. It amazes me that they all made it without any loss of life. Uh, when you think about it, that we talked a little bit ago about they would not have had insulated clothing as we know it, waterproof clothing. They would have been wet and cold. Uh, they traveled in the mountains, and of course they were bringing their, the surveyors were bringing their surveying equipment. Their boat builders were bringing their boat building equipment. So they had equipment, and the equipment was very valuable to them because without it, they were just lost. And each man was responsible for himself in so much as he was to provide himself with a good weapon and a small arm. He was to provide himself with six flints, a pound of rifle balls, a pound of powder, and a powder horn. And uh, then in return, he would get a ration a day. And a ration consisted of a pound of meat, a pound and a half of flour, a gill of whiskey, which I've been told is about a fourth a cup, and uh, whatever vegetables that you could find. Well, in the middle of winter in the Alleghenies, that's not really a lot, a few roots maybe. And so that's what they were going to live on. Now think of that, think of making a journey under those circumstances. And he was responsible for about 20 pounds of baggage, which would include his bedroll and anything else that he wanted to carry with him to make life a little easier, 20 pounds. That's not a whole lot. Uh, and so with that, um, that kind of a preparation they start out. They said that both parties hit bad weather, as you might expect, crossing the Alleghenies in January and February. And uh, they would travel until the wagons couldn't make it any longer. And when the wagons couldn't make it any longer, they tore the wagons apart and made drags out of them to drag their equipment because this precious equipment, whether it was the surveying equipment or the boat building equipment, had to be kept safe. They mustn't lose that. And the men would go ahead of them over those mountain passes and cut and chop and dig away at the snow. And when they came to a frozen a body of water or river that they had to cross, they didn't want to take a chance on the horses breaking through the ice with their precious bundle of, of things. Or they didn't want to take a chance on the ice cutting the horses and injuring the horses. The men would wade out into those February waters with the axes and cut away the axe, or cut away the ice with their axes so that they could lead the horses and the wagons through the water. And then, of course, you know, that night, there was no changing their clothes and getting a nice warm shower and all that kind of thing. No, that night, they simply hunkered down around the fire and, and dried out as best they could. And the next morning, they did the same thing all over again. And with that, they crossed the Alleghenies dip by dip by dip. And when they got to Summerlin's Ferry, the boat builders found that the uh, they had got there first, of course, since they had left first, but they had had bad health. There was some talk of smallpox. Now, whether they actually had smallpox or something else, whatever it was, they got over it, okay? They didn't die of it. But they had been sick, and so when the surveyors got there, the boats weren't ready yet. Well, this put them behind because they had counted on the boat builders being ready so they could just take right off the minute they got there. So that didn't work out. It took them a while to get the boats going. But uh, a fellow by the name of Jonathan Duvall was a uh, master boat builder, uh, a real, real Renaissance man. He was just, could do anything. And so when he got there, he got things up and going, and they got the boats built. They built um, one big boat. Uh, it's a covered flat boat, and they named it the Adventure Galley. Now, Rufus Putnam in his journals referred to that as the Union Galley, but we learned its name as the Adventure Galley. And then the second big boat, they named the Adelphi. It wasn't quite as big as the first one, and then they had three canoes. And so with that, they launched themselves out into the river, went to Pittsburgh, which of course is the headwaters of the Ohio. And uh, from there on, they made it on. They stopped for provisions along the way. 
And Rufus Putnam's nephew, John Matthews, was with me. And he was only 21 years old. And uh, it, I, I kind of caught me when, when I read the fact that he was in charge of supplies for this whole journey. Now, they were going to get supplies in Pittsburgh. They were going to stop at Buffalo Creek, a little bit below Pittsburgh, and get the rest of their supplies. And this young 21-year-old man with some background in surveying was in charge. I mean, what a responsibility for a 21-year-old to have the responsibility for every bit of stuff. I'm sure he had a list, but still, he was to get every supply they were going to need and have it ready and uh, uh, for them there at, at Pittsburgh and at Buffalo Creek. And uh, I often I often think what a huge responsibility for a young man that was, but he must have ma managed it quite well because uh, they were, here it is spring already, they've survived the winter, and it's spring the time they're heading down the Ohio River, and oh boy, does it look good to them because, you know, these are New England mm -hmm. men, and spring comes later in New England. And by April in the Ohio Valley, things are looking pretty good. You know, it's starting to green up. And many of them wrote in their journals and diaries just how great it looked. They said, oh, there's grass high enough to pasture horses. And uh, one young fellow exaggerated trifle. I think he exaggerated the trifle. He said there were so many fish in these rich waters that they flopped against the sides of the boat until a man couldn't have taken a nap if he wanted to. And so I think that might have been a slight exaggeration, but in any event, it really looked good to them. And, and they looked up in this uh, virgin forest on both sides of them, and they saw deer unafraid because they hadn't been hunted, you know, come down to the water to drink. And, and they even glimpsed buffalo. Now, a lot of people don't realize that there were buffalo in the Ohio Valley. They weren't, um, of course, by buffalo. I mean bison. We call them buffalo. But anyway, technically, I guess they're bison. And they weren't the same breed of animals that they have out west. Now, people tell me that there's a mountain buffalo and then there's plains buffalo. Obviously, we would have had the shorter-legged mountain buffalo and, uh, and not the great herds, thousands and thousands like they had on the plains, but uh, maybe hundreds. And they saw them grazing along the side, you know, great hairy cattle, as it were. And uh, they saw tracks of raccoons and birds of all description. And uh, they thought this surely was a rich, rich land, one of the most beautiful countries they had ever seen. And so on the morning of April the 7th, they are getting very close. And of course, John Matthews, for one, has been here before, and so has Rufus Putnam. And they know to watch for the big island that we call, uh, uh, well, it was Carr's Island back then, and uh, we call it Buckley's Island today. But in any event, they knew to watch for that, and so they were watching for the island, but it was early in the morning, and it was quite foggy. And so pretty soon, I could just imagine the excitement there must have been, because these men have been traveling for all this time, and here it is April, and they're in this rich land, and they're all loose to where they're going, and they're, they see the end of the island, and they know that the mouth of the Kingdom has to be any minute, because it's at the other end of the island. But do you know, it was so foggy, and the Muskingum was so overgrown with trees. Now, those of us that live around Marietta, and we go out of the mouth of the Muskingum today and look back, it's hard to imagine the mouth of the Muskingum being so overgrown with trees that you couldn't see it. But that was the case. It was so foggy, and the trees were so huge and overgrown that they went right on by and missed it. But of course, the fellows at Fort Harmer, those soldiers that were stationed there, they knew they were coming, and they must have been watching just as anxiously as anybody, because can you imagine being out here stationed as a soldier? You know, life was pretty monotonous, not near as exciting as they hoped it would be. And they had been watching for these newcomers for days, and finally they heard them coming. They heard the slush, slush, slush in the water, you know, as they came down through there. And they hailed them, shouted at them, and waded out into the Ohio and uh, brought them into shore, towed them back up from Fort Harmer into the uh, calmer waters of the Muskingum, and anchored them there out of the way of the current of the Ohio where they came ashore. And uh, waiting for them there, of course, everybody was probably, oh, I can just imagine the excitement of the whole thing, but uh, a, a group of Indians had been trading at Fort Harmer. Now, remember, this is before the Indian Wars, so it was perfectly okay. Indians frequently traded at Fort Harmer. And uh, the fellow, the leader of this particular group of Indians, which I think was a combination of Delaware and Wyandotte, uh, was Captain Pipe. And uh, Captain Pipe, I think, is one of the great tragic figures 
and there were many great tragic figures in the war that was to come, but he certainly was one because uh, he was the chief of the Delaware, and he, I think he had the big picture. He knew that a way of life was inevitably coming to an end, and he wasn't, uh, uh, you know, he had to be bitter. In fact, he had a lot to be bitter about. You know, I might tell you a little bit about Captain Pike right here, about his background. A few years earlier, this is 1788, a few years before that, there had been a skirmish involving some young Pennsylvania soldiers led by a man by the name of Edward Hand. Now, prior to this, the United States policy with Indians had been to try to settle them down, show them a little bit of force and settle them down. Well, this, this didn't work. It aggravated the Indians worse than anything else. And on this particular occasion, Edward Hand had taken a group of young Pennsylvania frontiersmen, militiamen, and soldiers in Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we had to pick up wherever you want to. Uh, when Rufus Putnam and the men of the Ohio, Ohio Company came ashore on that April morning in 1788, they were greeted by uh, several Indians that were there to trade at Fort Harmer, led by Captain Pipe, a war chief. Or, well, he was more than a war chief. He was actually a war chief of the Delaware. And um, they had been there trading peaceably, as they did frequently before the Indian Wars began. And But we can only imagine what Captain Pipe was really thinking as he watched those men come ashore because it would have been very obvious to anyone, white man or Indian, that these people were coming to stay. These settlers were, they were settlers. They were not trappers or hunters who were just going to pass through the country. They were bringing baggage and luggage, and they were obviously coming to dig in for the long haul. And more than that, they were bringing surveying equipment. Now, that was the one thing that would have told the Indian that these people really had intentions of staying and uh, taking over the land. Because when they saw the surveyors, they knew that uh, uh, when the surveyors came, that the land was going to be parceled out, it was going to be sold, and behind the surveyors would come the men with the axes and the plows, and the women and the children and the cattle and the horses and the, the whole thing. And so the fact that there were surveyors among that crew would have been very obvious and very meaningful to Captain Pike. Now, he had uh, quite a uh, background with the people of the area. Uh, several years before this, there had been a young man uh, by the name of Edward Hand. He was a captain, and he had a, a group of militiamen whose job it was to go into Indian territory and sort of settle the Indians down. They had been making raids on villages or something of that sort of above Fort Pitt. So Edward Hand was set out with this militiaman. Uh, they traveled for days and days and days. They didn't find any Indians. They were young Pennsylvania men who had been raised on the frontier. And as I've said before, uh, a lot of the people raised on the frontier had a real hatred of Indians. And they didn't want peace with the Indians. They wanted to kill Indians. It was just pure and simple hatred. And uh, much of his militiamen were of this ilk. And so from days and days went by, and they were cold, and they were wet, and they were hungry, and they were angry. They didn't find anybody to fight, and they were just getting meaner and meaner and meaner. And finally, when they found an Indian village, it turned out that it was a small Indian village, and the men of the village were most of them away, either on a hunting party or a war party, which left mostly women, children, and old men. Well, to make a long and very ugly story short, uh, Captain Hand couldn't control his men, and they just went off the handle. They went berserk and just wiped this village out. A really ugly, ugly chapter of American history. And uh, uh, there was court martials. I mean, it wasn't something that was passed over by the authorities, but what's done is done. You can't undo it. Among those people who were killed at that Indian village that day was Captain Pipe's sister and his mother. And so here, a few years later, Captain Pipe is there on the banks of the Muskingum watching more white people come ashore. And uh, Rufus Putnam wrote in his journal later, he said, Pipe appeared friendly. And you could almost sense his, uh, 
a uh, little bit of, uh, you know, apprehension coming up off the pages of the man's journal. And uh, Pipe appeared friendly, but we can only imagine how friendly Pipe felt as he watched those people come ashore. Uh, he certainly would not have welcomed them with an open heart because he knew that more of the same thing was bound to happen sooner or later, and it indeed it did. And, uh, but of course, that was far from their minds that day. I mean, as far as the settlers were, the men were concerned, they were happy to be ashore. Uh, one story that's told that is supposed to tell why we Ohioans are called Buckeyes has to do with Ebenezer Sprout, who uh, is coming ashore with the uh, men of the Ohio Company. And Ebenezer is a very tall man. He's like six foot two or three. Very tall by the standards of those days. And uh, so when the men are coming ashore, the flatboat is being towed into the shore by the soldiers in Fort Harmer. Uh, he stands out, head and shoulders, literally, above the others. And the story goes that one of the Indians looked at the other Indian and kind of nudged him and said, in the Delaware tongue, something like, Wahita, which means the big buck or big buckeye. And so therefore, um, ever after, the men who come ashore from the flatboats down the river were called buckeyes and settled on the Ohio shore. That's one story. There's others, but that's one. And Ebenezer Sprout turned out to be a very interesting man. He, um, was, he was already an interesting man. As with many of them, he had long experience in the revolution, fought uh, the British, and uh, he became Marietta's first sheriff in later years. And he was married to the daughter of Commodore Abraham Whipple. And that, that makes it an interesting story, too, Commodore Whipple. Uh, you see Ebenezer Sprout was kind of a, uh, well, he was described as a fellow who liked uh, jolly good times and good conversation, and he had the liberal habits of a soldier, whatever that was. And uh, so, when he married Catherine, the only daughter of Commodore Abraham Whipple, why, uh, you would have thought the Commodore would have had better judgment than to give him such a generous wedding gift. And the wedding gift that he gave Catherine and her new husband, Ebenezer, was the family farm. Well, he Ebenezer Sprout might have been a good soldier, but he certainly wasn't a good businessman. It wasn't long before he was through his money and her money and their money, and even the ancestral roof over their head was soon history. And so you can imagine there was a good bit of tension in that household. He was not the favorite of his father-in-law anymore, I'm sure. And so that may have been the reason why when Rufus Putnam came along a little bit after that and said, we're getting up a group of men to go to the Ohio company, uh, country, why that may have been why the Ebenezer Sprout volunteered so anxiously, so eagerly to come along. And uh, so he had come here uh, and later would bring his father-in-law, Commodore Abraham Ripple, into the Ohio company, into the Ohio country, rather not the company, the country. Why don't you go ahead and talk about Whipple at this point? I mean, I know that his boat building came a little bit after our mm -hmm. story, but maybe you can tie it into our period of because it became the uh, one of the first industries. That's right, yes. Well, Abraham Whipple, the father-in-law of Ebenezer Sprout, was a man very famous in his own right. Actually, he fired the first shots on the, at the British during the Revolution at the Navy. He fired on the ship, the Gaspy, and burned her to the water's edge. And uh, the story goes that Captain Wallace from the Gaspy sent this message to Abraham Whipple, and he said, uh, Abraham Whipple, sir, you have burned his majesty's ship to the water's edge, and I shall hang you from the yard arm. And uh, Abraham Whipple sent back a message to him, Captain Wallace, sir, always catch a man before you hang him. And so Abraham Whipple was neither hot nor hanged. And uh, later he did come to the Ohio country, as I said, with his uh, uh, son-in-law, Ebenezer Sprout. But by this time, his great career as a military man, a commodore, commander, all that was behind him, and he was getting on in years. And, you know, we talked a little bit ago about high points and low points, and I often think coming to the Ohio country probably was pretty much a low point in Commodore Whipple's life because he was one of those who came uh, just because he didn't have anything else to do, no place else to go. Uh, he had the one daughter and the son-in-law, and for better or for worse, he was best off going with them. You know, back then there wasn't any Social Security or anything like that to help older people out. And uh, when you were older, you relied on your family, and that's exactly what he was doing. He came 
the Ohio country and lived with his son-in-law, the one who had those liberal habits of a soldier that lost the family farm back east and uh, made the best of it. And the story goes that he planted a melon patch here in the Ohio Valley and doggone if somebody wasn't stealing his melons on top of everything else. Talk about adding injury and insult. And so he decided to take his old musket left over from war days out and uh, he said he was going to hide in the melon patch and when that rascal came to steal his melons, he was going to rise up and blow him to kingdom come. And so he hid out there for nights, waiting, night after night, waiting to see who was stealing his melons. And I thought, you know, just think, here's a man who bravely fought the British, who was a commander of his own vessel, a hero in the revolution, and now he's an old man sitting out in the middle of a melon patch, out in the middle of nowhere in the dark of night. You know, he must have just looked around and thought, this is what it all come to, you know. But anyway, he waited and waited, and so finally he found he was stealing his melons. It was a couple of young Indian boys. And he did not rise out of the bushes and blow them to kingdom to come. And later when someone asked him why he didn't, he said, uh, their glory days are over too, just like mine, only I know it's made up. But you know, his glory days weren't over. Because uh, a few years after that, the uh, people in Marietta, after the Indian Wars were over and they were looking around at what they could do to make a living, here they were surrounded by all this timber and these beautiful forests. And, and uh, what had they done back in New England? They had been boat builders, ship builders. And so somebody must have said, well, we can build ships here as well as we can in New England. And so would you believe in little old landlocked Marietta, they opened a shipyard. Now, this isn't steamboats. This is far before the steamboat era. This is ocean-going vessels, full-rigged ocean-going vessels were built in Marietta by various boatyards and various people in the Ohio Valley because they had some master boat builders. Uh, Jonathan Duvall was one, uh, just many others who were master craftsmen who could build these wonderful ships. Well, the first one they built, they named in honor of the territorial governor, Arthur St. Clair, and named it after him, St. Clair. And they were all set to take it down the Ohio into the Mississippi and on to parts unknown, except for one thing. We've got the boat built. Now, who is going to, who knows anything about boats out here on the frontier besides how to build them? And uh, so they looked around and somebody probably suggested old Commodore Whipple. And I can just imagine, surely somebody said, yeah, but he's getting long in years, isn't he? And somebody else said, well, you know, we don't have much choice. He's the only one. So they approached the Commodore with the suggestion, and he said, no problem, fellas, we'll take it and go. So he did. He got a, a crew of uh, frontiersmen who probably had never been out of sight of land in their life. And of course, back then, when the Ohio wasn't nearly as deep as it is today, you had to wait until the spring floods or fall floods in order to get your boat down into the water and get it down to the Mississippi without running on a sandbar. And uh, so they did, they waited until the flood was high, and they launched that ship into the waters of the Ohio, down into the Mississippi, down to New Orleans, which at that time was a Spanish port. And the Commodore made so much money with his load of salt pork from, and whatever it was here from Marietta, peach brandy maybe, uh, that he could go right on down to Havana and take on a load of sugar. And while he was down there on the islands, he took on something else that he didn't want. He took on the yellow fever. And a good many of his crew died on him. But not him, not the old Commodore. He uh, had fought more formidable enemies than the yellow fever. He was just fine. He brought his ship back up along the coast into the port of Alexandria, sold the sugar, sold the ship, and hiked back to Marietta with the money. And he was probably in his late 70s when he did this. And uh, so from that time on, they knew they had a money-making project on their hands. And they continued to build ships in Marietta until the Embargo Act stopped that. And, of course, that was one reason why Thomas Jefferson was not one of the favorite people of the Marietta settlers here. You see, the Marietta settlers, for the most part, were Federalists. And the Federalists looked at life a little bit differently than Thomas Jefferson. Uh, they believed that the government should shape the people or lead the people, that a strong central government was the way to go. They weren't even anxious for statehood because they felt that statehood would give, uh, well, I hate to say the common man, but I can't think of a better word. It would give people power that didn't know how to use the power 
they knew how to use the pebble. And so they should keep it uh, the way it was. Well, the Jeffersonians, on the other hand, they saw life a little bit differently. When the Federalists saw that the government shapes the people, the Jeffersonians believed that the people should shape the government. And yes, the common man did know enough to govern himself, and he should be given that right. So that was kind of a little political tug of war that was developing here as uh, things developed. And so, uh, so when Jefferson passed his Embargo Act, everybody said, see, we told you that that would never work. Look at the trouble it's causing us here in Mariana. And uh, so, but Commodore Abraham Whipple uh, was quite, a, quite an interesting character, as was his son-in-law, Ebenezer Sprook. Okay. Yeah. All right. Christmas wasn't really a big deal on the frontier because, of course, these were New England people who were not all that far removed from the old Puritan tradition that uh, you didn't celebrate on December the 25th. In fact, Marietta's first Christmas turned out to be a day of Thanksgiving. Or, as I say many times, our first Thanksgiving came on December the 25th. And as you might suspect, there's a story behind that. And the story is that uh, we, it all goes back to more Indian treaties. Now, we've talked before that there's been several Indian treaties. There's been one at Fort Stanwyck. There's been one at Fort McIntosh. There's been one at the mouth of the Miskingum, or the mouth of the Great Miami. Uh, these uh, treaties have been, I might say, more or less successful. But they weren't all inclusive. They have never, they're not sure. The people, the uh, settlers here are not certain. They're not comfortable with the idea that they have reached all the Indians. And so therefore, they decide to put out the word for more Indians to come into Fort Harmer and sign another treaty, yet another treaty, uh, agreeing on various border lines and agreeing on various areas to hunt and, and just whatever they can you know, decide to put in the treaty once they get there. And so they start the middle of that first year, they're here in 1788, uh, sending out the invitation for the treaty, the word. Runners are going to the various Indian villages and inviting them to come into Fort Harmer for a treaty. You know, this has already been tried once. They've tried a treaty up at Duncan Falls, and uh, for some reason or other, somebody went off the handle and shot at somebody else, and they never did decide who shot at whom or whose fault it was. The Indians blamed the whites, the whites blamed the Indians. But bottom line, the treaty never got off the ground. So this Fort Harmer Treaty is going to be yet another attempt to keep peace with the Indians. And so the Indians start arriving in September of that year, and when that, the treaty is slated for after the first of the year. So they're going to be here all this length of time. They're going to camp out around the Marietta Settlement. And so they start arriving in, uh, in September, and there's a story told of David Ziegler, one of my favorite people. He was a, a captain over at Fort Harmer. And he was one of the, he doesn't get much press. You don't hear a whole lot about him. But he was one of these people uh, who is just a born leader of men, and he really cares about his men. Uh, you see it throughout everything he does. You know, when he writes to the powers that be to make sure they get their pay on time, He's always concerned that they have warm clothes and extra blankets. He's a really, he's a good, good, caring commander of men. And he has the knack of taking a bunch of ragtag people out of the back alleys of Pittsburgh and Wheeling and whatnot and giving them some pride in themselves and really forming a strong unit out of them. And he's done this. He has a company of sharpshooters at Fort Harmer that is really an admirable bunch of fellows. And so they are given the task of uh, going up the river and escorting some of the Indian chiefs down to Marietta for this treaty when they begin arriving in September. And uh, we get this little vignette from Manessa Cutler's journal because Manessa Cutler, as you know, was one of the uh, shakers and movers of this whole westward movement. But he doesn't live here. He comes to visit. So he has been visiting at Marietta, and he's getting ready to leave and go back up the river to Pittsburgh. And just about the time his boat's getting ready to cast off from the point down there, uh, he hears the noise of the uh, coming of the boats down around the channel of the island there. And he looks up and describes later for us in his journal what he sees. First, he sees the canoes with David Ziegler and his men coming up down the river, 
uh, making the way, and behind them are the canoes with the Indian chiefs. And as they come out from behind the island, Ziegler's men rise to their feet in the canoes, balancing in the canoes. Of course, a canoe is a much bigger vessel than what we're thinking of, maybe. Uh, but they rise to their feet and they fire a volley of shots, which is answered from the guns of Fort Harbor. And then behind them, the Indian chiefs do the same thing. They stand up and fire. And in this midst of smoke and gunfire, there's absolute silence after the noise echoes away, dies away there in the valley. And they pull into Fort Harbor, and the soldiers of Fort Harbor make a kind of an avenue so that the chiefs can march up the bank and go into the fort to wait for the treaty. And uh, uh, Manessa Cutler was very impressed with that site. He was very impressed with Ziegler's men, and he was very impressed with the Indians that he saw. And one of the reasons, of course, why Ziegler's men had escorted them was, as I told you before, there were many, many people on the frontier who hated Indians and would take a shot at them just for no reason at all. And so the last thing that anybody wanted was for one of these Indians, uh, these Indian leaders to get shot or get hurt or get into any kind of a confrontation with some hot-headed settler on their way to a treaty. It could just blow the whole thing as it had at Duncan Falls. And so all during that fall, more Indians kept arriving every day. And they would just build campfires out around the periphery of the settlements there. And I might say here, uh, if we haven't discussed this before, that if, when we talk about the Marietta settlements, we're actually talking about three settlements. We're talking about one settlement down at what we call the Point, which is there where the Lafayette Hotel is today. We're talking about the settlement across the river from that, which was Fort Harmer. And then about three miles up along the Muskingum is Campus Martius, which is the main settlement of the Marietta. But there are actually three settlements. Today, they just kind of run into one another, but back then they were three separate settlements. But every night when these settlers looked out, there would be more Indian campfires. And uh, uh, I often think what it must have been like, because they were afraid. They knew what had happened at Duncan Falls. They had heard uh, many, many stories of atrocities on the frontier. And they were aware of just how many people they had. They had about 200 people in Marietta. And about 100 of those, 132, I think the exact figure, were men of fighting age. And so they were definitely outmanned by the number of Indians coming in every day. So every night when it got dark and they looked out at those hills around Fort Harmon and Campus Marshes, there were a few more campfires. And it didn't take long for them to realize that there were going to be many more Indians in number than there were fighting men among them. And something else that they would have realized that sometimes we forget, and that's that the Indians many times were better armed than the settlers. Because the settlers would have those old rusty muskets left over from the Revolutionary War, and uh, so many of them would tinker with them and try to keep them working, and sometimes they'd fire and sometimes they wouldn't. The Indians didn't fool around like that. When the Indian's gun didn't work, he might have it fixed a couple of times if he could find a good gunsmith. Then if it didn't, he threw it away and traded for a new one. And so the Indians, in most cases, would have been much better armed and would have been much better shots than the settlers, and the settlers would have know this definitely. And every night there were a few more fires. Well, Rufus Putnam took the additional uh, uh, precaution of having all liquor supplies in Campus Martius and the Point confiscated. He sent uh, Ebenezer Sprode and his deputies around to the different houses and confiscated the liquor supplies. They didn't want any gambling. They didn't want any drinking. They wanted things to stay on a level keel here because it was a tinderbox. You know, he must have, a General Harmer who was going to mastermind this whole thing, he must have felt like a man sitting on a powder keg in a lightning storm. You know, it would have been very nerve-wracking. And uh, so they did everything they could to keep this very calm. And so uh, when the 25th of December, things were still calm. By this time, there was probably about three or 400 Indians surrounding Fort Harbor. Well-armed men of fighting age, the best warriors from the various tribes, and there was about 132 men in the entire settlement around there. And so it was really kind of a tight situation. So by the 25th of December, only had just another week to go until it was the first of the year time for the treaty, 
And so uh, uh, General St. Clair decided that it was time to thank Almighty God that they were still alive, I guess. And so he proclaimed December the 25th as a day of Thanksgiving. So there was no record that they had any Christmas celebration as such as a Christmas celebration, but they did have a day of Thanksgiving on December the 25th. And uh, at this point, you know, there was a, a young fellow here by the name of Jim Backus. He was actually one of Ebenezer Fred's deputies, one of the fellows who went around sticking liquor supplies. But he kept a diary. And uh, we know a lot about the, what happened during those times from the various settler diaries and journals. And uh, there come a big cold spell, really a vicious cold spell that last week in December. I mean, the rivers were frozen over and the snow was deep and the wind was blowing off of that river. You know, it was only a can. If you've lived around the Ohio River, you know there's nothing quite like the wind coming up the Ohio River after a snowstorm. And so Joseph, or um, uh, young Jim Backus was uh, describing the weather, and he said that the water froze in the pitcher beside his bed, even though he tried to keep a fire. So that's how cold it was. And so he looked down and he saw the Indian campfires. Now the Indians are sleeping out there on the ground, you know, in this. And he sees the Indian campfires blazing, and he notices how the men, the Indians, are huddled around the fire. Now, Jim Backus is a, a good, kind, intelligent man. He's not a mean man by any means. And uh, he writes in his journal after he's looking out at those Indians, and I can just sense the astonishment of his voice. And he says, you know, I think the savages feel the cold even as other men. And, you know, when I read that, it just it gave me cold chills because I thought, what chance has any treaty got between people who are so far apart in understanding one another? Honestly, in his heart, he didn't realize that the savages were human beings just like him. You know, he had no idea. He said, I believe they feel the cold even as other men. And uh, that is, that's just such a chilling, chilling thing for him to say. And uh, so, but anyway, the treaty, uh, the treaty did get underway. Nobody got in any trouble, uh, except poor old General Harmer, who suffered terribly from gout. Now, gout was a, we talked about the footwear and the rheumatism and so forth on the frontier, but gout was the other great scourge of the frontier, simply because meat and protein was their, one of their, uh, probably their staple, staple uh, food. And so therefore, uh, they, uh, many of the frontiersmen suffered from quite a young age of gout. And I've never had it, thank goodness, but I've been told by people who have that your feet are so painful that I know one man told me he couldn't even stand to have a sheet touch his toes. That's how bad it hurt. So here we have this treaty with the Indians upon which people's lives are depending. And here is poor General Harmer who is suffering so from the gout that he's afraid to take his boots off because if he does, he's never going to get them back on. He's had his boots on for days just because he doesn't dare take them off. When you think of the pain, and there's no painkillers, no Tylenol, no no whatever you take, aspirin, whatever it is, there isn't anything. The only painkiller on the frontier is alcohol, and that's another story. But uh, if you're going into a treaty upon which your life depends, you don't want too much alcohol. So he needs to keep his mind clear. But his feet are so painful, he can't stand on them. So he sits on his great chair and has his soldiers carry him to the council house because he can't bear to stand, put the weight on his feet. Well, the Indians don't realize that this is because he is in such pain. They think that this is just the custom the white chief is carried by his men because he is just too, uh, I don't know what, grand a personage to stand upon the ground, and they never know. But I have a great respect for General Harmer to think that he stayed clear-headed and was able to communicate all the while that he was in such pain. And by communicate, uh, this wasn't an hour and a half's meeting. You know, if a meeting runs over an hour and a half anymore, we'd get really bent out of shape. This one went on for weeks. And it was something like the 7th or 8th of January by the time the treaties were finally signed there at Fort Harmer. And they felt fairly satisfied with them. They celebrated. They had a big dinner across the river at uh, Campus Marshes where the officers and their wives and the selected Indian chiefs came over. And they 
I don't know whether Rufus Putnam and Harmer and David Ziegler and Dowdy and all those fellows, I imagine they still had their doubts, but the average settler felt really good. You know, we have a successful treaty. What they didn't understand was, or at least what the majority of the settlers didn't understand, was that those three and a hundred Indians had been just a meager representation of all the tribes. In some cases, they were not the key figures in the tribes. And Indians did not necessarily feel that one man had the right to make a decision for the whole tribe. The Shawnee had not been there at all. The Shawnee had written the whole thing off. They had decided a long time ago that the white man was not to be trusted. They couldn't believe anything he said, and they just weren't going to waste any time on it. So they weren't there at all. Uh, so that was still a very risky situation to the South. But as a rule, the settlers felt, ah, oh, you know, we have peace and we're going to celebrate. And that was in 1789. So they had uh, about a year, about two years there that they probably felt pretty good about the whole thing. Um, 1789, was a, that was the year that led into the famine. So they got the treaty out of the way. And then they begin to have problems with their food supply. And of course, we've already told the story about the famine that uh, occurred because their crops failed. And uh, so when they got through with 1790, by that time, you could tell that the Indian situation was getting a little bit touchy, that the treaty had not worked the way they hoped it would have. Uh, various people had been, uh, various parties had been fired upon. A really scary thing had happened down at Belfry. Belfry, one of Belfry's main men was a fellow by the name of Nathan Goodale. And he had a marvelous, uh, really a unbelievable record as far as the Revolutionary War was concerned. He had just, he was just a real hero and had a lot of combat experience. It was a very experienced man uh, when it come to Indian affairs. And yet, um, well, to tell a little bit more about him, he had come here and settled in, uh, to Marietta, then he had on, gone on down to Belfry and settled. And one of the garrisons down there was named for him. There were three settlements at Belfry. There was Stone's Garrison, Farmer's Castle, which was a large fort, and then down below was Goodale's Garrison farther south. And so um, uh, one morning he had gone out with a team of oxen and another man to uh, pull stumps and get ready to plant. This was in March in the spring. And uh, um, he was working practically right under the guns of the fort. And long towards noon, somebody looked out and they could see the other man that had been with him off to the distance digging, you know, webbed stumps. But they noticed the oxen standing over there all by themselves. Well, at first they didn't think much of it. They thought, well, maybe he's just taking a rest or something. About an hour later, they looked out and the oxen hadn't moved, except to be stomping their feet and acting a little bit impatient. And at that point, they got concerned and alarmed the men, and the men rushed out to see what was wrong. He had vanished. And the man who had been working just a few feet away from him had not heard a thing. And yet they could see there was a little bit of snow left there in the corners of the field. They could see from the tracks that Nathan Goodale had been taken prisoner. And uh, they never saw him again. That was it. He was gone. Uh, they knew from the tracks that he'd been taken by the Shawnee. Of course, you know that back in those times, they could tell different tribes of Indians by the make of the moccasins. An experienced frontiersman could look, could tell tremendous things by the tracks. He could tell what tribe the Indian belonged to. Um, I've read that they could tell, um, uh, for example, they could tell whether it was a tall man or a short man by the length of his stride. They could tell whether it was an old man or a young man. Old people tend to shuffle their feet. Younger people tend to pick their feet up. They could tell whether the men had been together for a long period of time, because if you're together with somebody for a long period of time, you tend to walk in unison. You just kind of fall into step with one another. Or if somebody has just joined a group, they're more apt to be out of step. Or they can tell who's carrying a load on one shoulder, because that track is going to be deeper than the other. They can tell if someone went willingly or unwillingly. Uh, so they could, they could read those tracks as easily as you could read a book. And so from the tracks, they knew that Nathan Goodale was gone. Years later, years later, after the treaties were signed, they learned that um, uh, they heard, they never really authenticated the story, 
but they heard that there was a man taken from uh, that area, and the Indians said that he had been working with the oxen when they took him, and that he had died of a fever a few days after, or a few months afterwards on the trail. So they're assuming that that's what happened to Nathan Goodale, but they never knew for sure. So it was that kind of warfare that wasn't really warfare. It was almost like terrorist tactics because you never knew where they were going to strike. And they were so very, very, very good at it, so very stealthy. Uh, that was in Belfry, upriver at Lowell at Beverly. There was a similar story took place. There was a young man this time, his name was John Gardner. And uh, John was, uh, John had come into the uh, Ohio country. He was about 18, 19 years old. He had come with his friend Jervis Cutler, who was the youngest son of Manasseh Cutler. And uh, John and Jervis, you know, a lot of these young fellows came into the uh, territory looking for adventure. And they thought that this was going to be really exciting. And then when they got here, they found out that the axe and the hoe was just about as much a part of frontier life as a tomahawk and a gun. And the axe and the hoe wasn't exactly their idea of adventure. And so this story took place in the fall when they were harvesting a corn crop up at uh, uh, Beverly. And um, so I guess that day maybe John and Jarvis just wasn't too enthusiastic about cutting corn all day. And Jarvis, all of a sudden, he remembered something he just had to do down at Fort Harmer. So he took his gun and left. And so John, he started out with the corn uh, cutters in the beginning. And then after he cut corn for about an hour, he just happened to think, he hadn't cleaned his gun for a long time, so he just thought he'd just down the wall and clean his gun. And so while the rest of the settlers worked ahead in the corn patch, he sat there on the log cleaning his gun. All of a sudden, he heard a little noise over the edge of the woods, and he looked up, and there were three Indians and a white man. Well, the Indian war, as such, was not an open fact at that time yet, and so he wasn't unduly alarmed, and the white man stepped forward and said something to him, kind of soft, and John couldn't quite hear, so he leaned forward, and the man repeated and beckoned for him to come over, and of course his gun was all taken apart anyway, laying there beside of him, so he got up and left it and walked over so he could hear what the man said, and just that quick, he found a leather noose around his neck and a knife in his throat. And he knew if he said one word, that was it. And he couldn't, you know, he said later he couldn't believe this was happening to him because he could still hear the voices of his neighbors who were cutting corn just a few feet away. And yet here he was being taken captive. And very quietly, they eased him out of the clearing and right up along the edge of the forest. And John could hear the other people so very close, and yet they might as well have been a million miles away. And he was just taken just like that, right? And that's, that's the way Nathan Goodale had been taken, only he didn't escape. Well, they took John for about two or three days' march, and John, who was a good, healthy young fellow who was used to the uh, frontier, he said he was just about exhausted because they, the Indians just could kind of keep going at a trot all day long, and he was just pretty well worn out. And the first night, he thought, okay, I will, I'll, I'll escape, I'll get away. And then he noticed one of the Indians taking a bell, an old cow bell, out of his pack. And John thought, now what's he going to do with that? So what the Indian did, he found a little sapling, just a little tree, and he pulled the tree down across like this, and he fastened the end to the ground, and he fastened the cow bell on the end of it. And then he put John down across the tree with the tree right in the middle of his back. Well, not only was this awfully uncomfortable, but every time John moved, at least a little bit, that bell would ring. And so they said, all right, there you are. So they tied John down across the tree, and then they wrapped up in their blankets and went to sleep. And John said he spent the coldest, most miserable night. He felt like that sapling was going to be embedded in his flesh so deep it would never come out. And in the morning, they got him up, and another day off on the trail, trot, 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 all day long. And the next night, same thing, another little sapling, same bell, same John, same position. And the next morning, this went on for about three days. And John was just about worn out, and he must have had a backache like none other. Then on the third day, he could tell that they were getting a little bit more excited. He could tell they were getting close to home, wherever home was, John had tossed it. And uh, he, he was kind of glad. He thought, well, no matter where I'm going, it's bound to be better than where I'm at now. 
And then, that morning, when they got up, before they started off on the trail, they did something that just really changed John's whole outlook on life. They went over to the campfire, where the campfire had burned down, there was all that black ash, and they made a little paste out of the black ash, and they began to paint John's face black. Now, he'd been on the frontier long enough to know that black was the color of death. And when you went into a village with a captive's face painted black, it meant that you intended to kill him. And so John knew that this day was very likely going to be his last one if he didn't do something. Well, all that day they kept on the move, and John had no opportunity to escape. And thank goodness they didn't make it there that day. They slept that night. So that night, when they tied him to the ground, he thought, tonight is it. Because in the morning, we're bound to be there. And so when the, they tied him up and he laid down on that, uh, that uh, sapling. He thought, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die here. So he waited until he was sound asleep. And you know, luck was with him because a soft rain started to fall. And when they tied him down, John had tensed all his muscles as tight as he could. So that when he relaxed, this, the thongs that they had tied him with was just a little bit loose. And then the rain dampened him even more and he was able to move and loosen them. But he had to move so slowly because he didn't dare make that bell jingle. What a long night it must have been because he moved and moved and wiggled very easily so as not to make that bell jingle. Finally, he got his hands free, but he was still spread out backwards down over that sapling. So then he had to raise up inch by inch. You know how hard it is to do a setup? To set up. Well, this was the slowest setup. <laughs> Every muscle in his body must have hurt by the time he got to a sitting position. Then he had to move over and work on his feet, all without ringing that bell. And he managed to do it. And very softly stepped over his sleeping companion. Of course, every now and then during that process, one of the Indians would stir or slip, make a noise or snore or something, and John was positive he was going to be found out. But they didn't. They were tired too, and they slept soundly. And John was able to climb over top of their sleeping bodies and make it into the forest where the rain had softened the leaves enough that they didn't rattle and they ran away. And uh, as soon as he got to where he could run, he really made good time. I don't know just what the, the record for the four minute or seven minute or whatever mile it is, but I'm sure that he broke it. And uh, found his way back. He knew directions well enough to know what direction he wanted to go. And finally made it back to to uh, the fort there, where that uh, they had never expected to see him again. But uh, so he had escaped to tell them what had happened. That gave him a little bit of an idea of how Nathan Goodale had been taken prisoner down the river also. But it was that kind of stealth that kept the people so very much afraid.